Hello. Get started. We're going to get Happy started. Year. Now call this uh, special meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. Me, you have uh, several items here on the agenda tonight, and I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I mean to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to get, get out of here really bad. <laughs> to adopt the agenda, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we would ask that you add one of the property for closed session. Right. It, yes, and, and in, in the motion, we want to uh, add 102 Marine Boulevard to our discussion in closed session. Move approval. Second. Any other comments? Okay, here none. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, so I guess we're not going to get the early adjournment. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I'll let you go ahead and, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Woodruff, if you'd go ahead and uh, preface the, introduce the first uh, topic here. Okay. First of all, welcome to 2014. Uh, 18 degrees outside today, so. We know none of you are in a rush to get home because it's nice and cozy here in City Hall. But uh, again, we do appreciate uh, the holiday. The city employees really appreciated it. A lot of great services were provided by the police and fire and sanitation and, and street crews and a lot of beautification added during the year, uh, during the Christmas season by the parks and recreation folks. Uh, tonight, as we come to the first workshop in 2014, we have three items we'd like to discuss with you. We are very fortunate to have an excellent team that works with us on economic development throughout the county. The city and the county are the top funding sources for economic development in the county. And Sheila and Dan are here today to give you an update on some of the activities. I would also mention to you before they begin, some of the activities that they're involved in are actually confidential. And they would welcome the opportunity at a closed session, or not a closed session, but an individual session with you to answer other questions. So don't be surprised tonight uh, if you get a good report from them, but there may be some things that they're going to say to you, well, let me talk to you about that offline. Why is that? Because when you're negotiating bringing the industry to town, there are certain confidentiality statements that have to be signed. But uh, at this point, we'll begin our first workshop item. Let and, me interrupt uh, you just a moment. Yes, there. sir. Uh, what would be some type? What would be any restrictions on maybe a briefing of that sort of thing in a closed session? Seeing how it is, I mean, you know, we like to keep everything out front, but I understand there's a lot of things that they can't release. You know, it would have to be specific in reference to incentives, things of that nature, as we have done before on a couple of things several years ago, but. Uh, as they go through if there's a particular item I'd like to know more about that or we would like to know more about that as the council then we can certainly work with them and try to uh, make it so that it fits the definitions that are allowed for closed session on economic development okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. with that uh, I'll turn it over to Sheila and Dan please thank you very much well thank you for having us here this evening and in order to accommodate Mayor Phillips uh, desire to get to adjournment pretty quickly I'm gonna <laughs> Um, ask your indulgence and let me, uh, for the benefit of the uh, G10 viewers tonight, to give a very quick overview of what and who Jacksonville Oslo Economic Development is, just so that we're all on the same playing field. And I, I don't think that I will step into the areas of uh, the, for confidentiality tonight, although you, you are correct, um, but we'll stand ready to be available in the event that's uh, an area that you want to venture into. Um, if I may run through these fairly quickly so that we can get some to discussion. Um, what is Jacksonville Oslo Economic Development? It's a 501c3 nonprofit corporation formed in 1970. It's usually referred to affectionately as the Committee of 100, and it does operate the um, Economic Development Office located in the Commerce Center. Um, we are a staff of three, myself, Dan Oliver, and we have an administrative assistant that's just recently joined us, uh, Ms. <coughs> Melissa Kennedy. Um, we have a very concise mission statement that um, addresses the fact that our purpose is to stimulate, encourage, and promote economic development in Oslo County and its municipalities, and it's through the re, uh, recruitment of new business and um, the uh, expansion of existing business and industry. The basic definition of economic development starts out with the words long-term process that increases employment opportunities and wages, expands the tax base through private capital investments, and creates an environment that fosters growth, which increases and helps accumulate wealth, and that's our ultimate goal. The first rule of economic development to remember is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. Again, going back to that long-term process, and let me emphasize that. Um, 
most of you are certainly aware of how long it may take uh, to get a business to establish in Jacksonville, but that's the part that you start to see. What you may not often see in the part that we're involved in is the helping to get them here. Um, most of you hopefully have just recently been aware of the fact we were involved in an announcement with the new boat manufacturer, Armstrong Marine, that's going to be coming into the old Hatteras plant down in Hubert. We were very excited about that. We worked with them for a year and a half prior to that announcement. And our work has just begun because now we want to work to work very hard with them to make sure that they can continue to grow to actually produce the jobs that excited us about that announcement. Two main components of economic development typically are the new industry recruitment and the business retention and expansion. And when we talk about new industry recruitment, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in a moment, but I like to call that the sexy part of economic development. That's the part everybody always asks about. What's new coming to town? It's the part that typically leads to the ribbon cuttings and the photo opportunities and, and smiles on politicians' faces. Um, but I will share with you that I think an even more significant part of economic development is the business retention and expansion. And the reason for that is that 60 to 80 percent of all jobs across the nation come from existing industries and business that is already in business. But it's not usually, be, uh, a, a, I'll say, a noteworthy event. It's not something that finds itself on the front page of a newspaper because they do it at 5, 10, 20 jobs at a time. So it's not something that usually anybody even notices or has an opportunity to have fanfare. But they're the real jobs with an existing company that's already established its foundation. So they're very important. That's why we actually spend a lot of time with our existing businesses and industries. We spend a lot of time trying to build a relationship with them. We make sure they know that we appreciate them being here. We want them to stay and we want to know what we can do to, to help them. Um, uh, in fact, I can specifically tell you that your offices, your, your management office has been very helpful on several occasions when we've had a business that's <coughs> needing um, some assistance, whether it be with a permit or a, a something to help the safety of their employees or just having a question. It's, it's, it's important that they know that they've got somebody who can, you know, help them through the process because their job is to know how to do what they do, not to how to navigate maybe through some um, a governmental um, permitting process, et cetera. So we're here to help. In fact, our standing message to our existing industries is to let them know that whatever they're going to do in, in growing, buying equipment, um, whatever their needs are, if they'll call our office first to see if we have some way to help them to, um, sh you know, uh, shorten the process for them or just help them out with resources, to call us first because we, we want to be there to make sure that they know we appreciate them being here and that we want to be there. Your existing industries also, keep in mind, are the best barometer that you really have of what the economic health of your community is. So when they're growing, um, even through hard times like most of our nation has been through lately, or if they're staying stable, as we were quite happy to have many of them, but if you're, if you're staying stable or growing, that's your barometer of how your economy is doing. So we try to watch that pretty closely. The other thing to remember about your existing industries, so that you don't take them for granted, is that as hard as we're out there trying to recruit new businesses for our community, somebody might be recruiting them. So it's very important to keep them happy. One of the things that I learned in real estate is it's really easier and cheaper to keep a customer, or in this case a business and a client, than it is to go find a new one. So it's really a better use of our resources. New industry recruitment, again the one that gets all the attention. Well, we work with a lot of different um, partners and sources to, uh, for prospects, um, and we develop relationships with the Department of Commerce in the Eastern Region, um, site consultants, which are basically hired mostly by industries when they're looking to locate into areas, um, and uh, commercial brokers, and even sometimes the CEO of a company might call directly. Um, but most, most of the large industries now are starting to use a lot of site consultants. So therefore, it's very important that we build relationships with those people in advance of them even, even thinking that they want to come to Jacksonville or Onsdale County, because we want them to think of us when they do have that client that might fit into our environment. So we work very hard to spend a lot of time building those relationships because you and I both all know that in all of the commerce that we do every day, and many of you around the table are business people, people do business with people they know, they like, and they trust. And that is a, a basic philosophy that is also important in economic development. So 
when we're out on the road, um, whether it be at a meeting or a consultant event, um, I just recently did a literally a one day trip down to Atlanta as a part of the Department of Commerce Friends of North Carolina to meet with a lot of consultants that they had from the Southeast come in for a night. Um, it's all about building relationships so that we can be there and be on their mind when they, um, when they might need to bring a client to our community. The other thing is that although we primarily have been, at least to date, focusing on recruiting, I'll say, more industry, and, and don't necessarily confuse industrial with industry, but you know, large businesses or large employers to our community, we stand ready and often do help any kind of business that is looking to locate into this community. In fact, I will share with you that in the last three and a half years that I've been with the Economic Development Office, there is very few businesses that have opened up in Jacksonville or Onslow County, and I'm even talking about the retail and the restaurants and hotels and the hospitality industry, that have not either called us or passed through our office way in advance of anybody ever knowing they were coming through this community. And they're doing it because they want to get a gauge of the community. They want to know what's going on. They want to know what it's going to be like to do business here. They've done their research, and now they've come in to actually do a little bit on the ground. And as Dr. Woodruff um, referenced, um, we can't tell anybody that we're talking to them because most often we're under a confidentiality agreement. They don't want their competition to know that they're looking to come into this marketplace, especially um, uh, if it's one of those types of businesses that somebody might step in, beat them to, the, beat them to it, and then that would actually um, uh, negate them being able to come into this market and impacting them. So um, we, uh, and I enjoy that. My own commercial real estate background, you know, it thrives on that. So I'm actually able to still um, uh, enjoy having a conversation about the broader picture of our community. Um, quick slide that I'll uh, set in here that we use. Uh, this is called the site selection process. And this mostly is geared toward when we're dealing with large businesses or industries. And we call this the funnel. Um, our job is to try, whether it be through relationship building, responding to inquiries, but to try to get that consultant or, or client themselves interested in us enough to at least start putting us in their lineup. So they may do a regional screening and if we come through that, you know, and we go through the RFI and meet the evaluations and get to the point where they actually um, uh, can maybe consider us for a site visit, you know, we are excited. That pulls us down to an opportunity to, um, to meet with them. And then they'll go back and do cost analysis and, and then they might ask for incentives and hopefully we're in the finalists. But our goal here and the purpose of this slide is to really say we want to try to stay in the funnel as long as possible. Our goal is to continue to overcome any objections that they may have or reasons to exclude us from their decision making process. So we work really hard to try to um, help meet their needs and make sure that we, um, we have what they're looking for. Quick slide to share with you uh, what is most commonly asked for. Every industry or business that's considering coming to our marketplace has their own list of things that they need. Um, some might need rail, some might not. Some might need access to interstate, some may not. Um, most, in fact, 94% of all the inquiries we get are looking for an existing building. Uh, that's mostly due to the fact that um, most of those are looking for the quickest way to get their business up and operating. Um, the good thing about our economy is that unlike some parts of our state and nation, we don't have a lot of vacant buildings. The bad part is I don't have a lot of available buildings. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, quite frankly. Because if you don't have the inventory to show them something, they have no reason to come here in some cases because they're looking for that building. So keep that in mind and I'm always out there begging to find out you know, what's out there or what could be available very quickly. The one thing everybody is looking for is the last item on the list, business friendly government. They want to know that they can come in here and do business with someone that <coughs> understands the value of them doing business as well as the speed that they need to operate in, uh, in order to, um, to get there. Looking ahead, where we are right now. Um, Joe Ed has just recently engaged the services of RKG Associates. Um, they are a consultant firm out of Alexandria, Virginia, to help lead us through the process of creating our next five-year plan. We're very excited about this. We just recently came through a five-year plan. It was very successful. We had a capital campaign. Um, I believe we succeeded with most of the goals that were in that plan, but it's time to look forward. And it's in, um, uh, important now to uh, to create that plan and as a team. We'll talk about that in a minute. The framework was 
kind of four simple questions that, that came up. They're very simple. Basically, is what is economic development for Jacksonville and Onslow County? Because economic development is different for every community. It, it, some communities might be tourism based, some might be entrepreneurial based, some might be heavy in industry, light industry. Um, everybody's different retail. So we really need to refocus on what is it we want this community to be based on. And secondly, what is the role of Joed? You know, we're, um, we, we can't maybe do it all, but we want to make sure that whatever we do, that's what we focus on and we do it well. So, you know, whether we are going to focus on, again, on industry recruitment, whether or not we can have a role in helping working with the city as far as downtown redevelopment, um, if we are going to, um, uh, you know, certainly make sure that we focus on our military and our existing businesses, but let's just make sure that we all have an understanding and an agreement of what that, that, that role is. Um, what are the realistic expectations of our especially um, leadership and uh, elected leaders? We are what we are, you know, um, a, a large distribution company you know, um, won't probably consider locating here because they usually want to literally be right off of an exit of a high interstate or they may need rail to move their product. So we have to make sure that we're realistic about who it is we think that we can bring to our area and what we want it to look like uh, when we're done. And uh, last but not least, but how do we measure success? Is our success going to be based on the number of jobs we create? Is it going to be based on the amount of capital investment that's made in the community, which ultimately generates tax revenue? Is it going to be based on um, uh, maybe even average income, family income? There's lots of ways to determine, to measure your success, and every community um, is actually reevaluating that and picking their own. The economic development world has actually changed quite drastically in the last few years. Some of that may have been brought about, you know, due to the change in the economy, um, and some of it, a lot of it, has been brought about by technology. What used to be considered the ideal I'll say uh, manufacturing firm to bring in town would have 400 jobs. That same manufacturing plant right now probably has 40. They're probably higher paying and they're higher skilled workers, but the number of jobs is less. So the whole ec economic development world is kind of reevaluating, you know, their expectations as well as how they measure that. Um, we are hopefully starting to see ourselves come out of a recession. We are starting to see many businesses kind of pressing up against the wall, wanting to expand and are wanting to grow um, cautiously, but they're doing it. We've seen a dramatic increase in 2013 from the previous years, the records of previous years, in terms of the number of real bona fide prospects and inquiries that we've been dealing with. Um, it's been uh, a, a significant change and we think that that's going to grow in 2014 so we're making some internal changes in order to be able to handle that literally that increased workload and ramp up to try to grab as much of it as we can very very exciting but it's because of some of those changes that you've probably all heard about the North Carolina Department of Commerce they are they are also going through some changes they are restructuring part of that is to pretty much split themselves into a public sector and a private sector the public sector is for the most part, going to handle a lot of the operations, day-to-day -day operations, and the private sector, which is going to be um, a nonprofit partnership. In fact, they just today announced the interim CEO that was going to be um, that's going to be leading that um, is going to handle actually more of the true business of economic development, the true business recruiting, the small business and the marketing. And you'll notice I put in there the business development. That's the true going out there and recruiting the new industries. And part of the reason that they have felt that this was necessary is that they needed to um, make these changes so that they could better compete in the incredibly highly competitive world of economic development. Um, they have got to, they felt that they needed to move out of a government structure to get into a, a little bit more of an, an efficient, more nimble and um, uh, structure that could operate at the speed of business. Because one of the things that we, the feedback that we got from a lot of consultants was that North Carolina didn't move fast enough and that we lost a lot of business and industry because we weren't responsive enough to their needs. So that and also to be able to handle the confidentiality requirements that are required in this industry, um, that's are a couple of the reasons why this change is being taken place um, there. I have been incredibly privileged 
to be a part of um, this process. Last summer I was appointed by Governor McCroy to sit on the interim North Carolina Economic Development Board and we have over the last six months been um, creating the framework for the next 10 years, the 10 year strategic plan for the state of North Carolina which will be unveiled a little bit later this month. So it's been kind of an interesting process and I think also very good that we have also on the local level been kind of going through this at the same time and hopefully been able to incorporate some of that conversation. Um, but economic development is a team sport and it, it takes all the players and every player has a role in every, every project that we work on. And um, one of the reasons that we were excited about coming here tonight is because we need to ask for your involvement, each of you, uh, in the strategic planning process. Um, we are getting ready next week, Monday and Tuesday. We're going to have two different workshops that have been designed specifically to involve the leadership, elected and um, staff leadership of, of all the um, municipalities in Onslow County, and we will welcome you to please participate, all of you, and we'll make sure that Dr. Woodruff has that, uh, uh, the time and date information for you. Um, but we think it's absolutely critical that we have that input at the table. This is where we need the dialogue. This is where we need to know what you think we can and should be doing as uh, a part of the city of Jacksonville's economic development process and future and vision. So we really would like to have you there. Um, after this, um, wor these workshops, um, and they're doing individual interviews with a lot of the business leaders in our community and business owners in our community. Uh, the consultant will actually uh, formulate their recommendations, and in March they will present those to our executive committee and our board of directors, who will actually vote to whether or not to adopt those recommendations. Um, Mayor Phillips, Dr. Woodruff sit on our executive committee and our board so they'll be a part of the process and in, in helping to make those final decisions so that we can shape the next five years of our organization and uh, we strongly encourage you to participate and um and hope that you will and that way you can let us know what direction you want us to go in thank you thank you council any uh comments or questions just one observation you mentioned the importance and i agree about uh, keeping existing industry in business. Uh, years ago, when I was <clears throat> sat on the Committee 100 board, in recognition of that theme, we instituted an Industry Appreciation Day, <clears throat> the golf tournament, other activities, and so on. It was not only in, uh, in the idea of doing something to show our industry and business that we appreciate them being here, but it was also a recruiting tool to get them involved and also to invite state commerce people down in Jacksonville. Uh, I don't know whatever happened to that particular activity or whether it's on the, it, it, it fell, fell short of expectations, but well, I, th I thought it was a good idea at that it time. It really is. Slightly different structure, um, I'm familiar with you did. We um, got to the point where I think we were struggling to get participation they're working hard and it got more and more difficult apparently for them to leave so we've reached out to them to ask them what format will work for them and so in maybe smaller groups and maybe not as as public but we're trying to bring to them whether it be on an individual basis or a group basis um, speakers or workshops or roundtables for them to be able to get together to meet their needs, whether it be to help them with uh, human resource problems, et cetera. We are going to try to ramp up another opportunity to be able to make uh, to acknowledge them. We did uh, at our last annual meeting, um, uh, not specifically um, addressing, I think, any uh, one particular, but a few of the industries that were there. So it is important. It's a, it's a critical part of what we do. So we're trying to make sure we're reaching out to them uh, throughout the year, maybe not with just one one session. Well, this was more of a fun kind of day. Yeah. Golf, <coughs> tennis tournaments, or whatever. But whatever. You made reference to um, the changing of the, the, the profile of some of the existing businesses. You, you, I think you made a, you said something to the effect of businesses that may have uh, employed 400 people shrinking down in size and everything is that is that a common problem we're having here with some of our established businesses no and what it was not our existing business it's it's kind of the industry at the whole whereas typically you may be able to recruit a a manufacturing company 
where they used it used to be they would employ 400 people to be able to meet the <coughs> needs of their operation through technology and better skills these days that has shrunk and I'm, I'm using the 400 to 40 it could be 400 to 100 but what we've seen is the workforce needed by these operations have has been reduced they're being able to do more with less people because of technology and skills and I know I haven't seen you since then I don't think but I did want to congratulate you on being appointed to the uh, to the uh, oh, thank you. economic Absolutely. development commission I, it's very nice to know that the governor is kind of looking out for this part of the state you know it's, it's nice to have someone like yourself who's such a strong advocate for economic development sitting on that commission thank of course you. anyway I have a comment. Uh, you mentioned uh, it's nice to also know that the state is recognizing the assets, which is the 60 and 80 percent of the jobs come from current businesses. And I think one point that really needs to be addressed is overregulation mm. um, that you don't hear much about. If, if retaining current businesses is important, then someone at the state level needs to really look at overregulation in terms of OSHA, HIPAA, the new requirements are causing a lot of unnecessary expenses and just can't be afforded. Um, insurance, insurance rates continue to rise, causing undue uh, uh, financial strain on businesses that provide jobs, causing jobs to be diminished. And that has a lot to do with uh, declining jobs. And then unemployment, borrowing money from the feds that they can't pay back. Mm -hmm. That's a huge issue. Two billion dollars that all the businesses in North Carolina have to share in on top of what they already paid from their own operations. Mm -hmm. We can't sustain that. And so if job retention and business retention is important to the state, Somebody has to focus on the realities of keeping businesses here. Mm -hmm. And overregulation and continued rise in cost is going to equal less jobs because businesses cannot afford to operate with continued expense growth. They have to find it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And your payroll is your first one. So if I can throw that out as a business person because I know the bill that I just mm -hmm. got personally mm -hmm. to take care of unemployment that we paid out unnecessarily it's not right That's true. I know that the overregulation issue has been a topic of, of great concern at the economic development board level um, and obviously there are some issues that are federal level that they they can't even begin to control but on the state level I know they're trying to pretty much eat that elephant one bite at a time yeah. but you know talk about you you mentioned the in your slide there the business friendly government as being mm -hmm. you know part of the equation there you know uh, looking looking at some of the things I've seen you know over the last few years I don't know as though it's so much a problem with the local government as much as it is the regulatory it's environment regulatory. that has been established now mm -hmm. the thing about the thing I see is if we have laws on the book and we're uh, we're assigned this responsibility to enforce these laws mm -hmm. I think that if we don't then you know it's a problematic for us you know uh, the last thing in the world we want to do as a city is to run a, a pers prospect uh, a prospective mm -hmm. business out of here that's the last thing in the world we want to see happen but you know it's just with, like you go back looking at the situation down at the jail for instance so just don't mean to kill a lot of time here but say the the uh, problem at the jail which doesn't really have a whole lot to do with, uh, with it, but it, just to show you how the regulatory environment is, the smoke evacuation system presented a problem that, that was on the books. It was in the state code. Do we have a choice in enforcing it? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I know there was a little bit of, you know, bitterness over that not being signed off on right away, but, you know, that's just an example of something that we're obligated, you know, by statute, you know, and it's going to be up to mm -hmm. the General Assembly to, to look at these the regulations that are there and see what is necessary and what isn't necessary. Well, just so. to, you know, the point, uh, you each got a memorandum from a local businessman regarding some issues with the city building department and permitting relative to the retrofit of a building. You were studying those issues, but I'll give you an example. You know, right here on Newbridge Street, 
we have buildings that were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. For those buildings to be occupied today, they have to be brought up to today's code standards. That's unrealistic. Uh, it makes it, you know, it, we, we have existing development we call brown development, and brand new open development of undeveloped forest we call green development. Green development is normally cheaper than brown development. Why? Because you don't have to retrofit, you simply build brand new. If we're really going to get a revitalized downtown, and Sheila and Dan have been working with us to bring some folks down here, we're going to have to have some regulatory change. The new energy code, I mean, that alone is causing tremendous impact statewide. And while we all want to protect the environment and we want to be energy conscious and so forth, we have to remember that to pass these codes at any level, whether it's the city level or when it comes to building codes, it's done at the state level. When you pass those levels, uh, those uh, new regulations, you have to understand the true consequences it's having on your state. And so part of what we have asked <laughs> Sheila and Dan to do is to join us in talking with Secretary of Commerce about the regulatory environment that the legislature keeps putting us in. Exactly. Good presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Y'all doing a great comment job. on the, on the uh, strategic plan. This is not an update of the strategic plan. When we interviewed the consultants, and Ron and I sat in, the mayor sat in, uh, many of the others, county representatives, business representatives, sat in on the folks that were interviewed. The consultant that was hired was hired not to update the plan, but to bring us a new strategic plan. And part of what they're going to ask you when they interview you is for you to tell them realistically what you think this community can have. And let's just say for discussion purposes that one of the things that, that as an individual you want is some type of computer chip manufacturing company. Great thing to have. The nice thing about this company is they're going to look us in the eye and they're going to say, don't even waste your time going there because you're not going to be able to attract that. One of the things that, that led us to this consultant was that this consultant said, I'm going to listen to what you want, and then I'm going to tell you realistically where I think you can be successful. I'm not going to give you a menu that I don't think you can, can uh, possibly fulfill. Mm -hmm. So we hope you will take advantage next week of these opportunities. Absolutely. Please. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank well, you I will much. say that. I want to just tell you. Dr. Woodruff and, and Ron and the entire staff down here have been extremely responsive. Every time I've needed something, and I usually need it quick because these guys don't usually give me much response time, they've been right on top of it. I mean, the whole planning and permitting and everybody department been most cooperative, and I really appreciate that. Makes well, actually, the, the compliment really goes to Ron. He's the dragon slayer <laughs> on behalf of, of uh, these things. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, there have been three businesses just in the last uh, six months that really needed uh, the city system to work quickly. They contacted Ron. He got it done. So well done, Mr. Massey. <clears throat> the, those <clears throat> the meetings with the consultant mm -hmm. are Monday evening, six to eight, or yeah. Tuesday morning, ten to twelve, Commerce Center. Okay. So that's the opportunity to provide your input to the consultant. You know, and especially when it comes to what businesses really or industry should we really be focusing right. on and if you can't make either of those we will make sure there's a personal opportunity but we really believe that the interaction will generate some good conversation so we'd like to have you know a good room for each time and i know that some of you are not available during the daytime because of business obligations or geographic obligations if you'll let us know we'll be happy to set up a telephone interview so that you mm -hmm. can get that input carmen would you make sure that we get Thank you very much you. for the time. We look forward to many opportunities. Thank you. Mike, you guys ready? Spencer? Okay. Next part of the workshop tonight is to talk about the air pack replacement in the public safety department. Uh, we have, of course, the chief and we have uh, the deputy chief. And making the presentation, uh, um, 
Uh, Battalion Chief Hardison was very instrumental in this. Unfortunately, he has other conflicts this evening, so I don't think Jerry's able to be here. No, sir. He okay. had a busted water pipe. <laughs> had to cut out the wall of his house to take care of that. So, What you're saying is that his higher obligation dealt with his family, and that's a good thing. So. He said he had to eat, so. <laughs> well, good evening, Council, uh, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to be here before you this evening. We wanted to talk to you about uh, our SCBA and the situation with uh, replacing our SCBA. If you remember some time back, I don't remember exactly when, we had um, had a discussion about replacing the SCBA and it was going to be a pretty big expense. So we wanted to come to you with some more information in regards to that. Now, just for, you know, for layman's language, what we're talking about is air packs. Air packs, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if I say something that you don't understand, please don't stop me and let me know. <coughs> just a force of habit, I guess. <clears throat> so each one of our firefighters while they're on duty basically have an air pack assigned to the position they ride in on the truck so they can they can use that for firefighting. Obviously for the air pack, the use of the air pack so they can have a clean air source while they go inside uh, a smoke filled environment or anywhere where there might be hazardous chemicals and things of that nature, uh, hazmat leaks, hazardous materials incidents, things of that nature. Um, regardless what we uh, get direction from council on uh, with regards to uh, replacing air pipes we're going to have to replace our air tanks because they're they life cycle out and uh, we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail but they all have to be replaced within a matter of four years staggered uh, so we, we looked at uh, we've done some research analysis to see what would be some of the options that we could do as a city to replace the air pipes so to give you some background on where we're at right now, our current air packs are manufactured by a company called Interspiro, which is based out of Sweden. Uh, and they currently meet uh, standards that were effective in 2003. These standards are updated every five years, and so we're two standards behind now. NFPA 1981 and 1982, which states how the manufacturers have to design these air packs to affect firefighter safety and things of that nature. In our current inventory, we'll have 68 SCBA or air packs, 95 masks. Each firefighter is issued their own personal mask so they're not having to share and transmit disease and things of that nature. I think, I think let's make sure everybody is clear. You know, the, the pack itself is, is like a, a backpack and it's got regulators on it. And then and that's an interchangeable type unit. And then each firefighter has to have his mask, his or her mask, fit. And then on the back of the, the air pack, you load the tank, the air tank. Right. And you can, you can see this picture here. It's got a, a, pr a pretty good uh, um, this description of what Mr. Master was just talking about. The, the tank you see is the black cylinder on the back side of it. And the, uh, of course, the straps, the, the frame, the harness. Uh, there's an air gauge on there that indicates how much air they have in the tank while they're operating so that they can look at that. And then the face mask itself, like Mr. Massey had pointed out, like I said, we issue those individually to the firefighters. We issue them with their turnout gear, they're responsible for keeping up with them, things of that nature. The mask also, the mask for these air packs also have lights on the inside that give them an indication of how much air they have in the cylinders too. Like I said, these uh, packs are made in Sweden, so as a result, uh, shipping of the parts, things of that nature, drives up expense, causes the, the delay in delivery time for some of the parts. If we had to have a replacement air pack, we could look six, eight months to get air pack. So, and one of the other things that, that we've experienced with Interspira is that there's no standardization, no standardization between models. In other words, when they, when they get rid of one old model or, or develop to a new model, the parts and pieces, they don't interchange especially with the face masks. Um, as Chief Hardison had elaborated uh, when we were going through this, he's had five different face pieces. And those face pieces are quite expensive, you'll see shortly. You might, you might discuss why that is so important from a, from a standpoint of if you have to replace that particular air pack. Yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the things that drives the, the face pieces, each firefighter having their own face piece and things of that nature, has to do with the fact that OSHA requires us to fit test our firefighters. They have to put their air pack on, we plug them up to a computer and it makes sure that they have an adequate seal on the face mask. 
Uh, and as a result, with them being issued that face mask, if we have a change of air packs, if we decide we're going to go from uh, one model inner Spiro to another model inner Spiro, the face pieces are going to have to change as well. And that's the same concept if we went from one manufacturer type of inter, uh, SCBA or air pack to a different manufacturer type. So, so there's going to be some impact when we talk about the options as, as far as how we replace them. It's not going to be like replacing, uh, you know, for example, the way we did tasers. We did so many tasers this year, so many tasers that the, the next year. Um, it impacts how we do that. It also impacts how we replace those particular air packs. So if one falls off the truck and is damaged beyond repair, the ability to, to buy one off the shelf is very difficult because they're, they're, uh, that particular brand is aged. And if we buy it, then uh, I buy a new one, then those, air, those, those face masks are not irreplaceable. So it becomes, it becomes a difficult process for us to, um, to try to uh, replace those particular units. How long do they generally last? The, well, like I said, they update the standards that affect how the air pack or how the air packs are designed every five years. Now, typically what we find out is with well, these air packs, we've had them for uh, about almost 12 years, I think. So that's, um, that, that has an impact on not really the life cycle because we can use the air packs with older standards. To, and we'll talk about that a little bit more about why we sh probably shouldn't do that. But um, at any rate, the, the air packs, the life cycle on air packs, we're, we're seeing about 10 years use out of them. <coughs> the other thing that we find uh, as a factor that influences our need for replacing is the, the limited interoperability between our response partners. The number one um, mutual aid resource that we have in the city is Camp Lejeune. And their department is currently using a different style air pack. So if we have a firefighter that, if, if they come to us and they have a need for an air pack, there's not much help that we can do other than issue them a whole air pack and face piece. What well, the problem with the face piece is, if you remember, I told you they have to be fit tested, OSHA requirement. So if they can't legally and should not wear one of our face pieces. What about the tanks too? Yeah, the other thing is, is the tanks sometimes don't work back and forth. Now the tanks, back in that other picture, uh, the, the cylinders, a lot of the cylinders, there's, there's two manufacturers for cylinders. Luxfer is a manufacturer that's man, is probably the number one manufacturer for cylinders. But the problem comes in is the way they connect to the air packs. And so as a result, they're a little bit proprietary between different manufacturers. So we can't exactly swap out air, air cylinders either. So if, if because we're inter, intertwined with Camp Lejeune, that could present an issue if, if if we get to a fire and there's one truck here and we're working with Camp Lejeune or they're working with us and they need a replacement air pack off one of the vehicles. Do y'all have any kind of area, um, I would assume that you do, uh, some type of uh, meeting group or what have you of the different? Almost like a user group you're talking right, about. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean like with the base and any of the other ones that you might have mutual aid agreements on. Has there been any thought as far as how these things are purchased that everybody buys the same thing? Yeah, we do have some, some agencies that meet together like the, the Onslow County Fire Chiefs Association. That's one venue, the Onslow County Firefighters Association. But the Chiefs Association is probably the one that would uh, be able to accomplish what you're, I think you're where you're trying to right. go. It just seems that that would be a logical step is to try to standardize since you're talking about the need for interoperability and everything that everybody yeah. buying the same thing. And it might be a cheaper way to buy it too, you know, yeah. in the long run. And see, that's that's the exact point that we face with the 800 megahertz system because as you know, and you know, y'all all work with Mike and the department on the 800 megahertz system. We had different equipment with different departments, and you couldn't use it all together. 800 megahertz was to do it standardizes it. So, so some of the other factors we look, looked at were was the cost, what it requires for maintenance, the masks we talked about, and the improved designs based on the new standards, which improve firefighter safety. 
the comfort of wearing their pack, which they have come a long ways from what they were when I first started the fire service 20 years ago. And of course, the technology that becomes available to their packs as well. And we'll talk some.